Okay. Um, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're coming to um, from today. For those who don't know me, I'm Darlene McLennan. I'm the manager of the Australian Disability Clearinghouse on Education and Training, or ADSET for short. Today, I'm really excited to be um, welcoming you to the webinar, Screen Readers, Everything Access and Teaching Staff Should Know. This webinar will be live captioned. Um, to activate your captions, click the CC button in the toolbar that is located either on the top or the bottom of your screen. We also have captions available via the browser um, and Jane will add that to the chat box now if anybody wants to access it through the browser. Before I begin, I wanted to acknowledge that I'm on Lutrawida, Tasmanian Aboriginal land, and the spirit of reconciliation, ADSET respectfully acknowledges the Lutrawida nations and also recognises the Aboriginal history and culture of the land and pay my respects to elders past, present, and to many Aboriginal pe people that did not make elder status. I also want to acknowledge all the countries um, that um, people are participating from today in this session and acknowledge um, their elders and ancestors and their legacy to us and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait people who may be participating in the webinar today. Um, I'm going to hand over to Darren Britton, our National Assistive Technology Officer, um, to uh, do the um, to hand over to our panelists and to talk through the um, how today will run. So sit back and enjoy. And over to you, Darren. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Darlene. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It's a um, it's it's a topic we've been looking forward to sharing for a while, um, which is going through some of those basic 101 bits around screen readers and sometimes those questions that are um, uh, difficult to ask or too afraid to ask. So we're going to cover some things today um, with Doug, Keir and Andrew around, um, you know, what is a screen reader? What does it do? And how does that actually work? And they're going to share their you know, unique insights and experiences um, to help you uh, make the world just a little bit more screen reader friendly. Um, so we're going to go through in order. If you've got any questions as we go, please use the Q&A um, function to put your questions in. Um, and we'll get to those uh, towards the end of the, at the end of the webinar today. Um, I'd like to also just acknowledge in the spirit of reconciliation, uh, the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Now, while virtually connected today, we are presenting geographically dispersed and acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation in Victoria, the peoples of Stony Creek Nation in Tasmania and the Camaragal people in New South Wales. So our first uh, presenter or panelist today will be Andrew Downey. Um, so I might just start by asking Andrew if he can give us a little bit of a, a, a history of himself and his, where does screen readers come into your, uh, to your being in your world? Thanks, Darren. I, uh, I've been around a, a lot longer than screen readers. Uh, um, I did all my school education and all my tertiary study up almost until I started my honours year at uni, uh, taking my notes in hard copy braille. Um, so the first screen readers I used were uh, in the MS-DOS operating system. When Windows and Mac started becoming popular in the, the 90s, blind people were quite concerned because they, it appeared that we may lose access to computers, but I'm pleased to say that I think now we have better access to computers than we ever had. So what is a screen reader? A screen reader is software which is either built into the computer or it can be software that's installed. Uh, unlike what the name suggests, the screen reader doesn't read from the screen, it reads from further back in the computer. Uh, can you stop? Can yes, you stop? I'll Thank just you. let you screen share there. <laughs> Thanks. You'll take us through an actual screen reader at work. Here we go. So what I'm going to do is to let you hear a screen reader. Uh, now, what I should mention uh, is that 
a screen reader presents information that is normally presented on the screen via synthetic speech and or electronic braille display. Uh, electronic braille displays are little or perhaps not quite so little devices with plastic pins that pop up and down in the shape of, um, uh, of braille characters. So here we have a Word document. And this is what the screen reader sounds like. And the, the speech I'm using is one of the Microsoft One Call Voices. One of the things about speech synthesizers these days is that they are also built into the operating system. Heading level one, my dog Miffy. Heading level two, style heading two, what breed of dog? Style normal Miffy is a tri-colored Pembroke Corgi. So what we had there was the screen reader telling me that there was a level one heading and a level two heading and then the normal style. Using formal heading styles, whether it's a Word document or a web page, are really important. They do, I guess, two broad things for me. They give me the, the idea of how the document's structured. So uh, I know that a level one heading will be a major heading, say a chapter heading, a level two will be the next level down and then a level three, the next one from that. What they also let me do is to jump from heading to heading with the screen reader. Style heading two, where do they come from? Appetite heading level two. Now I'll jump back to the level one heading. Style heading one, my dog, Miffy head. So that's very important. And you can do that too. If you turn on the navigation pane in Word, you, uh, you can- Participants uh, can now see your screen alert. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you can also navigate by headings. So very important. Style normal, Miffy is a tri-colored Pembroke Corgi. I can adjust the speed. Rate 30. Cardigan. Pem Rapid Miffy is most. Cardigan. Miffy is a tricolored Pembroke Corgi. You probably find that a bit fast, so I'll slow it down again. Rate, rate 20. Rate 15. Now it's back to where it was. Another important thing when you're using synthetic speech is to be able to adjust the punctuation level. If I'm just reading for recreation, I don't necessarily want to hear every comma and full stop. But if I'm proofreading or writing code, then I do. Symbol level all. So now we get page one, section one, style normal. There are two types of Corby comma from Kerry Aitken to all panelists, Colin. <laughs> that was just uh, a message from Zoom coming through. There are two types of Corby comma, Pembroke and Cardigan dot. So now it's reading the comma and the full stop. I'll switch that off again. Symbol level none. And I can switch it back to none. The other thing that I can do is to get some information about the type of font that's being used and other attributes of the document. Style normal aerial 12 PT default color align left line spacing 1.2 lines. And that can, that can be very important, particularly when laying out documents and so forth. Let's just come down a bit. Cardigan. Graphic Miffy is mostly honey brown with white on her chest and paws. There is also some black on her back. Ears are relatively large and erect and she is sitting on grass, looking excited. So you heard the screen reader say graphic, so it knows there's a picture there, but the screen reader cannot interpret the image. Now I say that with a slight caveat because there is some progress being made in that area, but screen readers certainly in the foreseeable future will not be able to interpret things like charts and diagrams and so forth. So it's important to put the alt text onto the image and we'll be sharing links with you where I've done some demos of how to do that. Sidmel temp docket. Heading I might one. just quickly ask, um, Andrew, where you're going. So how intelligent is a screen reader? Is it, is it doing any navigating of its own? Uh, what I meant to mention, and I forgot, uh, was that uh, I can have it read the whole document to me and without stopping, or I can navigate by word, character, sentence, and so forth. Uh, uh, there's the navigation I showed you jumping through by headings and so forth. It also has its own search facility, which can be very useful, particularly on web pages. So yes, they are quite clever in uh, weeding out information that I don't need to know and, and giving me the stuff that I do need to know. That does depend again on the structure of the page, whether it's a Word document Jane or, Hawks to carry a or, a, uh, uh, or a web page. So tables, they used to be a real pain for screen readers, but they're now quite clever. Table with six rows and three columns, level one row, one column, one style table grid. 
So it tells me the size of the table. It's six by three. Row two, Monday. Let me, let me just go back to the top row. Row one. So uh, um, go across. Column two, Sydney. Column three, Melbourne. Okay. Back to Column the left. one. We'll go down to the next row. Row two, from Kerry eight. Sydney, column two, 18 degrees. Melbourne, column three, 10 degrees. So talking about being intelligent, what the screen reader is doing there is reading the column heading and then reading the cell that I'm focused on. And if I go down. Tuesday, row three, eight degrees. Wednesday, row four, 13 degrees. So now it's reading the row heading as, along with the, the cell that I'm on. Now that requires some diligence on the part of the people setting up the table. Uh, combined with doing some, um, some the, the screen readers can do some uh, configuration as well. I didn't say that very well, but I think you know what I meant. I'm going to very quickly show you Correctly one more table. This is on a web page, and this is getting a bit more complicated. Table with five rows and four columns, caption animals divided into sea and land dwelling, sea dwelling divided into fish and mammals, and Caption land dwelling divided into reptiles and mammals. Row one sea dwelling fish column one through two sea dwelling. So now we have a cell that merges two, uh, sorry, that spans two columns. Land dwelling reptile column three through four land dwelling. Sea dwelling. Back to the left. Row two sea dwelling fish column one fish. Sea dwelling mammal column two. So we have under sea dwelling, we have uh, fish and mammals to go down. Row three flat feed. Doesn't say flathead very well, does it? Sea dwelling mammal column two porpoise. So mammal uh, porpoise. Land dwelling reptile column three snake. Uh, you get the idea. Now, doing that on a web page is relatively easy. Doing it in Microsoft Word is more thought. Uh, I found how to do it with the NVDA screen reader, but uh, I, I suggest not doing more complicated tables in Word. Even this table, I suspect some screen reader users would find a bit tricky. Uh, because you're, particularly if you're doing it via synthetic speech, you're having to remember a lot of information all at the one time. I think that's all I need to say for the moment. So I'll hand back to Darren. I might quickly, because you touched on very briefly there, Andrew, um, uh, the image that's there. So what, what, what can and cannot be read by a screen reader? Te text can be read, uh, images cannot. Um, uh, as you might have noticed, when, when I when I press the command, uh, it can actually tell me the, the foreground and background colours, but it can't read images, so icons, uh, pictures of things, uh, it, it can't read them at all, so it has to be textual information. And pictures of text, uh, these days screen readers have optical character rec recognition built into them. Uh, which can be helpful, but uh, it, it's not an ideal situation if we have to resort to that. Uh, excellent, thank you. I'll just get you to stop screen sharing there, please, Andrew. There we go. I will just quickly find mine back up. Two seconds. I've lost my screen. And okay, our next panelist um, is Kia Bueller. Um, and Kia comes to us from lovely Deakin University, um, a student there. Um, Kia, would you be able to, again, give us a little bit of history of you and your interaction and where screen readers fit in your life? Uh, yeah, so as uh, Darren mentioned, I am a student at Deakin University. I'm in my second year of my Bachelor of Criminology. Uh, so I actually started at Deakin as a sighted student. While I've been vision impaired my whole life, not to the point uh, where I've needed a screen reader, uh, but I uh, lost, the lost the significant amount of sight uh, about two thirds of the way through my first trimester. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, I had to, I wasn't able to finish that trimester and I had to learn to use uh, screen readers in order to be able to go back to uni. Uh, so I have had experience with a few different screen readers. I started off with uh, Windows Narrator or Windows Eyes uh, and then moved on to NVDA and JAWS. And now I'm actually mostly a MacBook user. So I mostly work with voiceover. And yeah, I think... 
sorry, I was just muted there. I was just saying that's great. Thank you, Kia. Um, so what um, what equipment can you use um, with the screen or what equipment can use the screen reader? So obviously most people would associate a screen reader with computers and uh, these days, uh, as far as I'm aware, pretty much all computers uh, come with an inbuilt screen reader and if they don't, uh, there are a couple of screen readers that you can install. So other than that, phones and most tablets will have screen readers with uh, on them, but also something such as smartwatches, uh, both the Apple smartwatch and Samsung smartwatch, uh, TVs, some, some smart TVs have screen readers in them. Uh, gamers have been very excited because the new PlayStation 5 has a screen reader inbuilt into it. Really, uh, most modern and smart devices, like screen readers are becoming a lot more common uh, and we're seeing them in, in a lot of devices. So, but in general, in regards to academic purposes, majority of screen readers, uh, majority of computers and tablets will have screen readers available and you can also download other ones. Excellent. Um, so do the commands vary between the different screen readers and devices? So there are three screen readers you can get on, or three major screen readers that you can get on Windows, which is uh, Windows uh, Narrator, also known as Windows Eyes, NVDA and JAWS. For the most part, the uh, commands don't vary but much between these three. An important thing to know with screen readers is that they also rely a lot, like just on the inbuilt system commands that we would use every day, uh, control C for copy, control V for paste, those kind of commands. Uh, are still like those commands still function within screen readers. When it comes to screen reader specific commands, uh, most uh, computer based screen readers will actually still use the same uh, screen reader key. So a lot of screen readers will uh, have something called the JAWS key or the NVDA key or the VO key for voiceover. Uh, and in a lot of cases, while this uh, might be something extra, pretty much all of them can be changed to caps lock. Uh, so, um, things do, uh, and in regards to screen reader specific commands, um, for the most part, no, like a lot of, uh, so L will often be, uh, next list, R will be next radio item, and this is the same with JAWS and NVDA, and I believe it's been a while since I've used Windows Narrator, but I believe Windows Narrator as well. Things do change a little bit, uh, when you move over to MacBook and VoiceOver. Uh, this, this is something I'm still kind of learning and teaching myself. Um, uh, so if you don't go on to uh, the QuickNav version of VoiceOver, um, the uh, keyboard layout and everything is completely different to what you would expect in JAWS or NVDA. Uh, if you do go into QuickNav, it is a little bit more similar and probably a little bit closer to what Windows users would recognise. Uh, and outside that, uh, obviously, when you go into devices that don't use keyboards, so use swiping, such as phones and tablets, boy, uh, so Apple devices and Android devices are supposedly fairly different. Talkback and Android device screen reader is one of the areas that I don't have any experience with. Uh, but from what I've heard, it's definitely not uh, as... Uh, I've heard that uh, some iPhone and iPad users have had a difficult time transitioning to Samsung devices. So from what I understand, the uh, commands and uh, gestures used are quite different among those two. But I don't know the full details in that area. Great. Um, can a person using a screen reader um, read information as fast as their sighted colleagues? So this this is this really depends on uh, the screen reader, the information being presented, and the person uh, reading. So a lot of uh, blind people, including myself, will have experience of sighted people hearing our screen reader and going, "How can you listen to that? That's so fast." Um, majority of that us have heard that hundreds of times, uh, but. It really does depend on the uh, screen reader. So for example, in my case, absolutely not. So uh, I am a specific case because as well as my vision impairment, I also have auditory processing disorder. So uh, hearing things quickly can be difficult for me. Um, uh, but again, like I said, this one really depends very on the user. Some people can get through things really fast and some people just really can't. I know for me, it can honestly take a couple of hours just to read a textbook chapter in my specific case. Um, but, and, it, and also, again, it depends on how 
well the information is presented, uh, how well it's formatted and layout to be as accessible as possible. So there's there's no real black and white answer to this. I think like most things, it, it's, it's <laughs> great. The whole lot is great. Yeah. Um, which is another, um, I mean, I forgot to mention at the very start that we're trying to dispel a few myths as well that are around. So um, if we touch on some of the questions um, and myths that you may be aware of at your institution, it would be good to know. Um, and one of those, um, which I hear quite often, is, is it only blind people that use screen readers? No, so this is a major myth, yes. So. Uh, while blind or vision impaired people are definitely the people who are most associated with using screen readers, we're absolutely uh, not the only people who do. So pretty much anyone uh, with a print disability, and for anyone who doesn't understand what a print disability is, it's any disability that impacts someone's ability to read visual materials. So uh, dyslexia, some learning disabilities, visual processing disorder, in some cases autism and ADHD, all of these which can affect uh, um, all of these which can affect reading visual material, anyone under that aspect can use uh, uh, screen readers. So as well as being vision impaired, I'm also autistic. As well as being vision impaired, I'm also autistic. Uh, and I know that a lot of people in the autistic community, uh, especially those who use our AAC, augmentative and alternative communication devices, uh, actually really enjoy using screen readers as well because they find it a little bit easier than processing visual information. Uh, so, and then again, some, it's quite popular among some people with dyslexia. There's actually a uh, sort of a screen reader app uh, called Speechify, which is specifically designed for people with dyslexia. So uh, no, this, well, definitely more common amongst blind and vision impaired people. We're absolutely not the only people to use them. Excellent. It's a, it's a good point. And the technology has certainly changed so much. I mean, people are using assistive tech in their smartphones, um, whether they consider it to be they're using Google Voice, they're using Siri, they're using our range of things. So assistive tech is creeping into everybody's uh, um, life. Dictation, which is another really popular one um, used by blind people uh, and other people with disabilities is becoming, again, just generally popular amongst the population dictation. Yes, yeah, so. Yep, excellent. Thank you, Kia. Um, we'll touch back with um, some of the questions um, coming up shortly. Um, I'll throw over to Doug McGinn now. Doug's joining us um, from, uh, I would say from the beach, but we couldn't quite get the Wi-Fi working at the at the beach. Um, so Doug's joining us on, the, on his phone today. So um, apologies if we can't get the camera up, but then we don't want to be jealous with your location either, Doug. Um, so Doug, can you give us a bit of your background and uh, where you intersect with screen readers? Thanks, Darren. So, Darren, I'm a, an accessibility advisor at the University of Tasmania, and I have worked there for quite a few years. Um, like uh, Andrew, when I studied, uh, I did everything underneath a, a closed circuit television, which is a large magnifier. Um, and the screen readers, when they came about, did make my life so much more efficient, being able to read uh, by listening to text so much quicker than trying to look at it with large print underneath a, a closed circuit television, a screen magnifier. Um, I obviously have some residual vision, but certainly if things are text-based, then I can actually read material quite quickly. And Kia, um, who spoke very, very well, it's a bit embarrassing talking after you, Kia, but uh, I'll see how I go. Um, Kia did talk there on a really important point in the fact that screen readers aren't just sitting at the laptop you know, doing my work. It's also, you know, when I'm on a bus watching Netflix, for example, you know, I'm, I'm using my screen reader to work out what program I'm going to watch or how I pause or fast forward. So it's all facets of our life, whether it be you know, a boiling kettle or a stovetop. Um, certainly there's lots of different devices now. Thanks, Sarah. Um, just before I get to your next question, this is an impromptu question um, that's just popped up because you've said another myth that gets me when um, uh, when somebody mentions that you watch Netflix and they'll go, but you're a blind user. What do you mean you're watching Netflix? Yeah, so, so certainly for somebody like myself with a bit of residual vision, yeah, I might put the screen quite close, but there's also the wonderful advent of audio description and most um, programs, you'll, you'll notice some programs on ABC and SBS now have... Uh, audio description. Uh, you can turn that on and off. Um, but certainly lots of the new films and TV series is within Netflix and some of the other streaming media will have audio description. So it has the same audio 
for everybody, but in the very quiet parts, it will describe what's going on. And there's nothing harder for a, a blind or vision impaired person when they watch a 60 minute murder mystery and suddenly the last 15 seconds is, and the murderer was, and they flash up a picture of the murderer and you're thinking, right. <laughs> so with the audio description, it will interact between the average audio and provide descriptive um, uh, and and certainly it does have an educational aspect as well because if we are providing YouTube clips, it is important that we provide them in captions for deaf and hard of hearing. But similarly, if there is important facets of the visual that is happening, it's important that that's also audio described for any blind or vision impaired um, people using that material. Yep, excellent. Thank you, Doug. I know I put you on the spot there, but thank you. Um, it's just one of those ones that I hear quite often. Um, so I suppose my, my next question for you uh, is the, you know, where do screen reader users get training? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because all students, when they come into TAFE or uni, need to be able to read or write at a certain level. Obviously, there are some entry-level courses where they will assist with that toolkit. But generally, students with a vision impairment need to be able to use their assistive software at a reasonable level. They don't need to be super users like Andrew. They can be more average like myself, but they still need to have a, a good level of file management because, you know, if they're getting lots of um, Word documents sent to them, then they need to be able to file them away into folders that make sense, alphabetical lists, things on the desktop. They need a good understanding of where uh, files are. And, and just... And, and, and one of the things I did want to mention there was it, it's not the responsibility of the university or the TAFE to train up the student at that level. So I think that's a bit of a, um, uh, a myth that it's important for the, for the education institution to assist, but it's certainly we're not here to train up the student. And, and uh, Jane was probably going to put up a, a URL in a moment of a, a really good pre-planning toolkit that ADSET has developed for NDIS participants with different disabilities, including those who have a vision impairment, who are entering higher education or vocational education and training. And it provides a really good understanding for the participant, the family, and the NDIS worker as to who is responsible for what, as in, you know, who's going to pay for my jaws at home and who's going to train me up with regard to different levels of um, uh, need at the institution. Thank you, Doug, which kind of leads into the next one. So where can a screen reader user go to get support? Yeah, so it's sort of um, in interesting, this one. As I mentioned, students should have a, a reasonable level of skill, but quite often it's, it's the access to the material or access to the hardware on campus, as in I can't access my material, I need a designated person, and it's not necessarily the accessibility advisor, most universities and TAFEs will have a transcription service that more than likely is in the library or a similar type area. And they'll have a designated contact person that will assist them with getting access to the material. Now, if the material is presented in PDF and it's text, they may need some extra assistance in how to access that material or they may need it converted into Word. Similarly, if there's a new laboratory with certain software that they need to access, um, then it, it might be up to the accessibility advisor um, or the transcription service to help them access that software. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention was um, peer mentoring. Um, it, it's one of the most important things that I uh, learned when I was a student myself and when I became an accessibility advisor many years ago was putting students in contact with other students of a similar ilk. Now, if you've got a blind student who's trying to understand the learning management system, which has changed, we've all got different learning management systems. Ours is called Milo. And it's, it's not intuitive because it's quite obvious, it's quite often it is visually intuitive. There'll be a, uh, a something that's flashing that shows you where to go. And if you're looking at a certain part of the screen with your screen reader, you might not know. But if there's another student who's used JAWS or NVDA, then they will more, more likely already gone through and worked out how to use that uh, learning management tool. So it, it's, it's really important to put you know, some of the students in contact with others. There's 2,000 staff at the University of Tasmania. And as far as I know, I'm the only 
JAWS user, I actually talk to the two students who use JAWS if I've got an issue in Milo and I'll ask them how we how they do certain things. So I think that peer mentoring is is a really important thing. Thanks, I couldn't, couldn't agree more, Doug, which I mean, that's where you get some of that expertise from, which is uh, another myth that um, I'd like you to answer if you can. And that's that our screen reader uses the experts in accessibility. Um, and, and, and the resounding answer is no. Um, I, I'm an expert in what I require. So I, I have a certain level of understanding of my assistive software. Like I said, it was a bit embarrassing going after Kia. You know, she was talking about different platforms, different operating systems, jumping from Apple back to PC. Whereas for myself, um, you know, I'm in a busy workplace um, and, you know, I concentrate on what I need to know. However, there are some situations where user testing is a good thing. Um, you know, it's important to get consultants in to check accessibility of softwares that our institutions are using. But there are times where some user testing within your institution could be a good thing. And that might mean, um, you know, Kia, we'd like to employ you for two or three hours to check out our new learning management system to let us know what we think of it. But we shouldn't be expecting students to do that for free. We should be building in a bit of a budget for that to happen as well. So, so the answer is that certainly screen reader users have a good understanding of what they require. Thanks, um, Darren. All right, thank you, Doug. Um, we'll get back to you um, with some of the other questions. I think there's a couple which align line up with what you've been speaking about as well. Um, I just wanted to quickly go through um, a couple of key points here um, now about what we can do to make uh, your world a little bit more screen reader friendly. Um, and I'm Darren Britton. Let me just quickly introduce, um, I know Darlene did at the start, I'm the National Assistive Technology uh, Project Officer for the NDCO program um, assigned with uh, the Australian Disability Clearinghouse. Um, my journey with screen readers is I don't use one. Um, um, I've played with them um, many times. I've played with different ones back from Windows Eye um, through JAWS when I had access to one because it's a very expensive piece of software through to NVDA, which is a pretty bit of software. Um, and I can use it for some of the basic things for some testing. Um, and that's as far as my expertise with the screen reader goes. In terms of making learning content then accessible, that's an area that I've been involved with for a couple of decades now. Um, so what can you do? to make your world a little bit more screen reader friendly. And Andrew touched on this um, and it goes across even into learning management systems, et cetera, and that's use headings. Um, one of the key things that you can do is use headings and give your documents and online content some kind of structure so that there's navigation. Without that navigation, um, it's really difficult um, to move around. It's fine when you've got a small amount of text that's there, like Andrew's you know, demonstration of Biffy, um, who's a fantastic corgi, of course, um, that's there. But imagine a 600-page book um, that's been converted, that you've just got the text of with no heading structure, um, no subheadings, and then no page numbers. No, how do you find anything that's in there? It's just a big block of text. Um, second one would be to use the accessibility checker within Microsoft Office. We know most um, institutions are using Microsoft Office or Office 365 um, as the business um, software that's there. And I think all of the Microsoft um, products inside the suite have the accessibility checker. Andrew might correct me if I'm wrong, um, but it's, it's available across wrong. most most of them. Um, and there's a link to that that we'll be sending out to everybody as well. Um, you can provide meaningful links, you know, things like click here. Um, means nothing to a screen reader when, if you're skipping by the links. Um, and I'm sure everybody's probably experienced that. And if you start to get a longer page where there's lots of those, um, yeah, how do you distinguish one from the other? So provide some meaning and context that goes there. So, um, and that it's also with the other with your other content. Why are these five links on this page? Why do you put them there? Are they there for a specific reason? Did you want somebody to look at them and read them? Did you want somebody to bookmark them for later? Um, so provide that that meaningful structure um, around your content. Um, you know, a brief a brief description as to why you provided a link um, is, is a good idea. You know, here's a video that we'd like you to you know to to go and um, review. Um, the following is a journal article on such and rather. I, you only need to read the first two pages um, because it might be a 10 page or 100 page thing. So give some kind of context for what you're expecting people to go and um, read. Um, 
Doug touched on, you know, that that uh, navigation and sorting of things as well. And so did you, Andrew, with the, you know, files. Give your files meaningful titles. You know, naming everything. And I've seen this um, over way too many years. The number of files that are downloaded that are called lecture. Um, I don't know which subject it's for. I don't know which week it was for, what topic it was on, anything. So it's assuming another whole level uh, for people to go and sort what they are later. So it's a little thing that you can do. Just give it a meaningful title, your file names. Um, say what you mean when you're recording, describing a function. Um, this has become more apparent certainly with COVID, but even prior to that, we're doing lots of screen capturing. Um, so we, people are recording their screen, screen showing, showing something in operation, um, you know, and they're moving the mouse around saying, so if I just go over here and click on this, and then I do this, you'll see the result. That means nothing to a screen review. Actually say what you're doing. Say I'm filling in the field, then hit the submit button, or then go and select whatever it actually means. Not So if you just go to the menu and select that means nothing. So give it give it some actual real context that's there. Say what you mean. Um, a great one, um, particularly for some first year students coming in, if you know some of the keyboard shortcuts um, for some of the software that you'll be using, um, make that available to students. Um, as, as Kia touched on, you know, the keyboard shortcuts um, would be a, a fairly similar um, in a lot of a lot of programs, um, particularly on Windows. Um, so providing some of those out to students just helps them um, navigate. And even like if you're whilst you're in um, uh, Zoom and or Teams, etc., telling somebody just to mute, giving them the command keys um, to quickly be able to mute. Uh, uh, and I've even forgotten what it is in Zoom. Darren, yes, and no. you're talking about and you're talking about that for all students, not just for, yes, for all students. students. Yep. Yes. For all students, just let people mm. know you can quickly mute your microphone by doing Control A. I think is the audio in Teams. What is it in Zoom? Anybody Alt know? Alt A. Same thing. Alt A. Um, so you can quickly mute and turn your microphone on and off. Um, a key thing that we see, I've seen quite often, um, and I'll, I'll get you all to chip in here if this is something you've become aware of or missed out on some important information because it wasn't put up front. I've gone into a few learning management in systems into um, content and you scroll down, down, down the page and now hit some bright red text that says important. Um, you know, due date has been changed for such another. It's right at the bottom. It doesn't have a heading. It doesn't have anything else. You won't find it because the screen reader uses it's not going to quickly um, scan the page. We'll touch on the skimming of that in a moment. Um, key thing that you can certainly do at an institutional level is include screen reader users in projects and program development. So if you're upgrading your LMS, get them involved. As Doug said, you know, having other students there um, and doing things is um, you'll get feedback from actual users. Lived experience. It's fantastic. You know, capitalize yeah. on it. Darren, just to go back on your previous point with regard to important information being a long way down in your document or web page, yep. the tips and tricks that you're providing today for screen readers, as Kia mentioned, if there's five screen readers at your institution, there's going to be 55 with learning disabilities who are using assistive software, and there's going to be 550 CAL students, students who are linguistically diverse. They're all going to benefit from these tips and tricks with regard to laying out the information in a more appropriate manner. Yep. And I think that's an important thing to just talk about there. Thanks, Darren. I think it is. And we're, and we're touching on um, uh, getting into universal design for learning as well, which yep. is uh, we could spend another five hours on that. And there's a um, new launch of a new um, e-learning um, ad set thing, which we'll touch on in a little part. Um, and most importantly is ask somebody. Ask somebody at your institution, whether that's staff and or students, as Doug said, you know, you can ask some of the students that are there as a um, as an academic or as, as a teacher, you can always ask the student, um, you know, was that Word document fine that I sent out? Was this, you know, accessible? You know, certainly you're not going to bail somebody up in front of the class and ask them for that, but you could just ask for feedback on, you know, did everybody find those documents fine? Is that good? You know, and um, leave that open. So ask, don't assume, because that's where we start to make all kinds of issues. Um, so there's just a few links I'll quickly go through and then we'll get into some of the questions. Uh, so there's some links which we'll um, have up with the, um, the slides which will go online to the Australian Disability Clearinghouse on Education and Training, so for AdSet. There's uh, Zoom hotkeys and keyboard shortcuts and keyboard shortcuts for Microsoft Teams as well. I suggest everybody go and look at those and just include them in your meeting when you're sending it out. It's a great thing to do. Um, improve the 
improving accessibility with the built-in Microsoft Office Accessibility Checker. So for those that haven't used it, here's a quick guide from Microsoft um, to go through that. There's a disability awareness e-learning um, that AdSet um, has set up, which is a fantastic resource for all of those basics, understanding various disabilities as well. Uh, Andrew has his own set of guides, which are on AdSet as well, which are great. Um, they might be old, but it's still perfectly relevant um, for what's there. And that's a guide to the hierarchical headings um, that he was talking about. So heading one with a heading two with a heading three, et cetera, and the importance of correct document structure. So going through that. There is also um, some upcoming AdSet guidelines um, on online tertiary access for students and staff who are blind or vision impaired, which covers a whole bunch of um, some similar UDL um, things that are in this universal design for learning. It touches on tips and etiquette for screen reader users, et cetera. Um, so a question that I um, quickly had, that says so I'll just stop sharing now. Um, that was with that. So two quick questions and we'll get into the other questions. Um, skimming. Skim reading. So I'll open this up to the whole panel. Skim reading content. Um, is that possible with a screen reader? Sort of. <laughs> particularly, particularly if there's a if there's structured headings, it's possible to to jump from one section to another quite to another quite quickly. What we miss out on though is the ability to very quickly just see something further down oh that's what i'm looking for reading with a screen reader whether it's with a braille display or synthetic speech is a very linear experience um and yeah so we don't have quite the same um flexibility i guess is the word i'm looking for uh, just to see something that we're looking for uh, there are tips and tricks so headings uh, the search facility can be useful if you ha think you know what you're looking for, but uh, there's still that there's still that whole uh, linear experience that, that's going to make skim reading more problematical. So times times an aspect that's that's there. Um, I know something I've experienced over many years is that. Um, you know, here's, here's a chapter to go and read. You know, a sighted user may quickly be able to get through that chapter in, you know, 10, 15 minutes, quickly skimming through, getting the key bit of information. But as a screen reader user, and this is a question without notice, Kia, I suppose, you know, studying some of this content, how long does it sometimes take, depending on the content, um, to get through that with the screen reader? Uh, apologies, Darren, could you please just repeat that? I had you and my screen reader talking at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so, which leads to another question. I'll get to that. I was just saying with um, uh, reading a chapter, um, you know, it might take, you know, a chapter that I might be able to read in 10 minutes or something. How long might that take with the screen reader? So as I mentioned before, with me, there is the extra challenge of having auditory processing disorder. So my experience isn't necessarily, I mean, no one's experience is... Um, the same as everybody else's but for me uh going getting through a chapter uh having the mix of relying on a screen reader with apd uh it can actually take a couple of hours yep exactly everybody's it's, experience it's is very different. tiring it's uh yeah um I, I have a friend who uh can can go through a chapter with synthetic speech and she hears all the words but if she's then given a comprehension test, she fails. But if she reads it with the electronic braille display, she goes really well. <laughs> uh, so again, it's, uh, it's, it's individual differences. And some people can process information very well auditorily, uh, whereas others uh, uh, find braille much, a much more effective means. And some find a you know, combination of speech and large print and all sorts. Yeah, so now, very varied. We've... We've got a few questions here, so I'll just open these up to the panelists and we'll try and get through them as quickly as we can, because there's a few. Um, uh, so screen readers can read the alt text. You, sh you showed that, Andrew. And if there's no text there, what does it tell us? What does it tell you as a screen reader user if there's no it'll, alt text? It'll just say graphic. Or well, sometimes <laughs> it, it reads the underlying file name, which is not terribly enlightening. Yes, so if a file name comes out of a database or a system, yeah, it's 101157352222.jpg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Uh, and Darren, and remembering that it's not just pictures, it could be a table or a graph that had been inserted as a picture rather than text. If it's a table of text, then we can read it. If it is the picture of a table that's been inserted, 
we won't be able to read it as well. Yep. Um, and Andrew, you touched on, you know, that style uh, and formatting of text being read out. So there's a question, you know, should we advise people to turn on the reading of the formatting and styles if there's important uh, information in a specific document, for example, highlighting specific phrases and words? Um, are some styles for bold, etc. cetera, uh, bold, for example, bold, italic, color, font type, better to use than others? Uh, certainly, I, I would almost always have the formal styles turned on in words. So headings, normal, normal style, list style, those sorts of things. If you bold text in, the, say, the middle of a sentence, uh, it is possible to have the screen reader read that, but it does start to get very verbose. Uh, so it, it, it becomes a bit of a juggling act. Do I want to, to hear every time the colour changes? Uh, if that's used sparingly, that, that can, can be reasonably effective. But if, if it's every second line, then it, it, <laughs> it does get very wearing indeed to be hearing all this stuff. And it probably largely depends on the content that's there it, as well. It certainly does, but yeah. But uh, yeah, bolding individual words and so forth uh, is a bit of a... Uh, uh, oh, it's a bit of a, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a bit of a double-edged sword. I can get the information, but it, it can get very tedious. Yep. Uh, again, it's the sort of thing that's so obvious visually, uh, but particularly with synthetic speech compared to, say, a braille display, uh, it, it can get very labour-intensive. Um, there's another question. Um, some students um, told, this is from Sandra, some students have told that the newest Kindles do not have a screen reader anymore. Is this correct? Has uh, anybody had a newer Kindle? That was the case going back a decade or so. The, the uh, Authors Guild in America launched uh, litigation against Kindle because they said that providing speech output was violating their copyright. And they lost the case, but Kindle took the, the speech off anyway. I'm not sure where we're up to more recently. Certainly, if you use the Kindle reader on Windows, you can certainly get speech output by using your screen reader. But I, I, I don't know if the others know, but I don't know what the story is with the, with the Kindle device itself. I'm not sure. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Rhodes is asking, can I have some clarification of the screen reader um, or screen readers that may be used for children with dyslexia? Uh, that's a good question. I think, Kia, uh, you touched on that. I, I would say that every every student, every child would be need a, an individual assessment. And you know, in some situations, a, a generic LD bit of software, learning disability bit of software like read and write might suffice. Um, but certainly, I think it's a bit hard to sort of make a, a generalisation to say this would be the best way to go. Um, but certainly, there are some students with a vision impairment and dyslexia who would use you know, something like read and write, and that would that would suffice. Very but I, th I think they'd need to be individually assessed. Just, just to go back on something you mentioned before with regard to bolding, with regard to educators that may be here, mm -hmm. quite often in an exam paper, you'll have answer three questions and the three will be underlined or bolded or something like that it is really important to uh, if you are going to be bolding certain things within exam papers or tests or assessments that you do think about it okay I do have a uh, a blind or vision impaired person in this unit let's let's ensure that the the questions the instructions are um, not just visually um, intuitive and similarly let's make certain that all the questions uh, as Andrew mentioned, that they are able to be read in a linear format and that there isn't, please interpret this graph, yeah, for example. Yep. That's, you know, if there is, please interpret this graph, well, let's, let's do an alternate um, question for um, Bill who might be doing the uh, exam as well. Uh, let's do that in a text format for Bill directly. And it's yeah, not... So uh, alternates. That, that, Sorry, yeah. alternates can come into play. Um, just, Keo, just, sorry. sorry, just sorry, Andrew. Kia, you um, were just going to um, talk to the dyslexic, uh, dyslexic um, software. Yeah, so as uh, Doug mentioned, look, it, it's not uh, necessarily something that's going to help everyone uh, with dyslexia, just how some blind and vision impaired people would prefer other screen readers rather, 
over others. The specific app I had mentioned before, so it's an application called Speechify, uh, and it's an application you can download on mobile devices or it's a browser extension, I believe for Google Chrome. I believe currently though, that's the only browser you can get it on. And so it was designed by someone with dyslexia and it's mostly a case of uh, uh, copying and pasting text into the application. And you can essentially uh, turn its uh, sort of, selling line is that you can sort of turn written books and written words into audiobooks in a way. Uh, so you can create sort of like folders that kind of read out like chapters in a way. Uh, and you can also, so as well as having it read out, you can adjust the font and the size of the text. And then with reading, you can, uh, so with a lot of, uh, so for instance, if you were listening to an audio book on Audible, you only have like certain uh, speeds you can go to whereas with this uh, particular app you can actually really uh, change the speed and the, just the way that the uh, apologies <laughs> uh, just the way that it speaks to you so it's something I personally have found uh, really helpful uh, in regards to my textbooks uh, being able to listen to my textbooks through this app uh, but yeah it was specifically designed uh, with people for people with dyslexia in mind uh, and so the app is called Speechify. And it's a, it's a very useful little app as well. Um, there's, there's also voice dream reader for the iPhone, iPad, yep. which is a nice little tool. Um, uh, don't forget also the immersive reading tools within the Microsoft Office products. They can be very helpful. Uh, touch on that. And there's, there's, there's a good. stack of other stuff too. Uh, some of it's free, some of it's quite expensive. Uh, so Read and Write go, uh, would, is quite expensive. Claro Reads, another one. Uh, but there's, there's yeah, increasingly some quite nice, either inexpensive or free tools available as well. Yep. Um, now we've got lots more questions. I don't think we'll get through them all. So I'll just quickly try and just uh, um, uh, does the panel think Read and Write Gold is a useful screen reader? Again, it's horses for courses. Uh, for some students and some applications, it's brilliant. For others, not. So again, it needs individual testing. Uh, preferably do a bit of testing yourself before you purchase um, and try and talk to some peers in your same class with a similar situation. Thanks, Darren. Okay. I mean, read and write is specifically for people who have literacy uh, reading difficulties, not for vision impairment. Just keep that in mind. Um, uh, and two quick ones um, that are here. So quickly, um, are there particular, <laughs> this could, we could be a three hour webinar on its own, are there particular challenges navigating PowerPoint presentations? Depends who writes the PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. One thing to definitely avoid in PowerPoint and in Word and that is floating text boxes, adding new text boxes because they're technically invisible yep. um, to a lot of users. So no content will come out from those. Um, are there, any no-goes, again, similar question, things to avoid. I remember a few years ago that PDFs of scanned readings always needed to be done and basically converted to text-based, not photo image-based. Are there any tips that would be useful? Um, PDFs, yay or nay, Kia? Uh, so I, I was actually gonna, trying to answer the question beforehand, <laughs> but uh, in my case, absolute nay. I loathe PDFs. Um, I find them uh, really difficult to navigate. Quite often you'll just come across ones that aren't tagged. I personally hate PDFs. Some other blind people don't mind them. So similar to a lot of the other questions you've answered before, uh, it really depends on um, the person. But I would like to touch on like a combination of this question and the last question Sorry, regarding yes. PowerPoints. Got PowerPoint, yes. Um, is to not, uh, things to avoid is to not use Prezi. <laughs> uh, Prezi is co like completely inaccessible. It's, uh, I've had lectures use it and it's, yep. it's yeah, it's just not usable at all with screen readers. Presenters, even the text as a visual, as a graphic, it converts all the text yeah. to a graphic. So it makes it even worse. Yep. Um, Darren, if I could just quickly answer the bit with regard to conversion of text, yep. there are some very good OCR, optical character recognition programs, which will, will convert pictures of text into text, um, but they're not foolproof. And I'll give you an example. If you're reading uh, a long report and you're looking for the conclusion, uh, you might do a word search for the word conclusion and it's recognised the I as a one, you won't find the word conclusion. So yep. that's, that's where uh, OCR isn't foolproof. So that's where it's always best to get the original text-based document 
or have the document go through your institution's um, transcription service. So OCRing um, by the student or the staff member is a good uh, temporary interim situation, but it's not foolproof, certainly not when it comes to academic materials, when you are doing page referencing and, um, you know, I think well, Doug's been hit by a wave at the beach, <laughs> by the sounds of it. Um, quickly, Andrew, just with the, t the time constraint. Sorry, um, PDF, yay or nay? I'm a, oh, I have a love-hate relationship with them. If they're done well, they are very, very usable, but most aren't done well, and that's a real frustration. I could spend yep. an hour giving you a, a rundown on PDFs. <laughs> a quick uh, tip, I yeah. suppose, um, with that is most people create PDFs from Microsoft Office, from a Word document or something it, like that. So if you put create, both up. Yeah, if you create from Microsoft Word and it's a properly structured Word document, then you will get a very good PDF, but by and large. There are a few caveats to that, but by and large, that would work very nicely. Uh, and you have all access to the bookmarks, which is a nav great navigation facility, all that sort of stuff. Uh, all right. but, but most of it, and uh, very, and people should not be distributing uh, uh, scanned images on PDFs. That just should not be happening in tertiary education at all. But they um, still do. I don't realise there's some other questions, and we'll give those out to the panelists, um, and we'll put all of those up. Um, onto the website. Um, so today's presentation will be going up on the website and we'll also be getting the transcript. And thank you uh, to Mel, our captioner for today. So we'll be getting the transcript um, of this up along with the questions and we'll follow up with all these other questions that everybody um, that we didn't get to today. But I'd like to thank the panelists. So thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Kia. And thank you, Doug, for your time today and for your insights, your experience um, into this. I know we did only scratch the surface um, of, of screen readers, etc. But I do hope that this was useful for people because I think we need sometimes we just need a bit of a 101 and a bit of a reality check of where where some of this is at the technology as amazing as it is and it's jumped forward in leaps and bounds it has its own issues um, and I think the key message and takeaway from me every user is different everybody's skill level is different and the same is said for academic staff as well so support each other um, the peer support as Doug is saying is fantastic and it also is with academics as well so if you can help somebody out help make something a little bit more screen reader friendly then please do but thank you everybody any last words from any of the panelists Andrew, Andrew. Oh, just thanks very much for listening and I hope everyone found it useful thank you Kia Apologies, I've had my I've had voiceover reading out all the comments that have been coming in, so I've completely missed everything that's been said for like the last few minutes. I was going to touch on that. I was just saying thank you, Kia. Um, any last words from you? Uh, no, yeah, just just uh, thank you. I really really enjoyed uh, being part of this. So, uh, <laughs> apologies, having AP Dean <laughs> hearing two different things at the same time is a is a sensory yep. nightmare for me. So it's like one of the many questions we didn't get to. We had hundreds of them, um, and one of those was certainly screen readers are reading out the chat. So every time somebody's putting something into the chat box, it reads out by the screen reader, and so you've got multiple points of information. Um, and Doug, you haven't been drowned by a wave. Are you still with us? Last words from um, you? Uh, just just ask questions if you're unsure of other users, whether it be students, ring up Vision Australia, ring up Visibility, talk to other people if you're unsure, uh, use the Austed list, use your email lists, just ask questions. That's probably the best thing. Thanks, Darren. Yep, no problem. And thank you, everybody. And thank you, Adset, for um, hosting today. Um, I hope everybody um, got, uh, got some useful information out of it. So thank you, one and all. And there is a survey, Darren? Yes, sorry. Yes, in the survey um, link that's in chat there. And we'll be going out. So we'd love everybody um, if they can uh, go and fill in survey, please, that be coming out. But we'll seek to answer the rest of these questions and get these up onto the uh, onto the AdSet website as well. And we'll get that information out to everybody. But thank you all for joining us today.